Great. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks again for joining us on uh, this year's Water Watch Lecture Series. Uh, this is session number two, How to Go Electric. Uh, my name is Brian Taylor, and I'm the educator with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the NSRWA, we're just a little uh, small grassroots nonprofit. Our office is in Norwell, but we work all throughout uh, several South Shore area towns. Um, and, and our uh, mission is just to preserve and protect one of our most uh, valuable natural resources, uh, of course, that being water. Um, if we were in person, I would ask everyone here who has ever used water before, raise your hand. Uh, and so, of course, water is incredibly important. Yeah, water is incredibly important to us, and uh, we do all we can to help preserve and protect that for people, for wildlife, uh, and uh, for safety, for recreation for all the things that we um, use water for uh, at home or in our communities. So we're always really excited to partner uh, with various organizations, including Mass Audubon. And we're also uh, really excited uh, to uh, have sponsorship once again for the Water Watch Lecture Series. So uh, this year's sponsors are, uh, and a big special thank you to Clean Harbors and the Mass Cultural Councils of Duxbury, Hanover, Marshfield, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth and Situate have all uh, provided uh, support for these educational programs. So we're, we're a big thank you to all of them. Uh, and uh, we always look forward to having their support uh, for this, especially going forward to promote educational programs just like this. So um, as usual, I am joined here by uh, Mass Audubon's Doug Lowry, uh, who I'm always really excited and happy to work with. So Doug, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Brian. And yes, uh, we here at Mass Audubon are celebrating yet another year of this series and, and just so grateful for the partnership with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. I have to say that the, that the watershed uh, ha, ha, is amazing in that its outreach is well beyond the many communities that it serves. Its reputation over the years uh, as a, a dynamic organization, nonprofit that can move mountains is, is now legendary. And uh, you will see a number of other watershed associations looking to the North and South Rivers Watershed Association as kind of the, the leader uh, in, in the pursuit of clean rivers. So we're so grateful and uh, very excited again to start this uh, this year's series. Last last weekend was uh, last week was a great, and I anticipate the rest of the series is going to be just a lot of a lot of information and a lot of fun. So uh, quickly, uh, Mass Audubon uh, realizes that if we're going to talk the talk, we're going to walk the walk, and with our action agenda. Uh, that came about two years ago. Uh, we are shooting for uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, and we're on the way uh, by taking steps to do our part uh, in, in reducing carbon emissions from fossil fuel consumptions. Uh, we've installed and upgraded a, a variety of green features at our wildlife sanctuaries. And we have reduced our annual carbon footprint by almost 50% since 2003. And a lot of that is due because, because of our uh, solar uh, panels and our, and our uh, solar energy efforts uh, along through the state. We have uh, solar panels in 20 locations across the state, and it gives us about 37% of our energy needs uh, across across all of our sanctuaries. So uh, we are uh, definitely uh, waiting, can't wait for Laura Burns' presentation tonight. And Laura Burns from Hingham Net Zero, we're going to pass it over to you, and uh, we look forward to what you have to say for us. Well, thank you so much, Doug and Brian. I'm really honored to be here to talk to you tonight. I was asked to talk to your crew about what are ways that each of us can, can uh, make decisions in our life to fight climate change. So uh, I'm 
Oh, somebody is sharing, so I can't share. Somebody else needs to oh, share. Ow, that and was me. I will share. Great. And great. we'll oh. get started. So I've lived in Hingham for 36 years, and um, a lot of what I've done uh, in the past years has been volunteer in town government. I served two terms on the Hingham Board of Selectmen, and I now uh, serve on the board of the Hingham Municipal Light Plant. Um, and where I've come to try to help Hingham find our way in the new energy economy. Uh, but I'm also a founding member of Hingham Net Zero, which is Hingham's uh, citizen climate activist organization. And uh, I'm going to talk about what we do a little bit later. But uh, first, let's talk a little bit about the climate emergency. And it is a real and true emergency. It's no longer in the future. It's happening now. Already millions of people have had to leave their homes because of extreme weather caused by climate change. This summer in Pakistan, 30 million people were displaced by flooding, 30 million, and it barely got a mention in the Western press. And not only is uh, climate change out of control, we don't even know all the ways it's out of control. We know there are tipping points, which if we pass them, the changes will spiral out of control and it could be from melting permafrost or the slowing of the conveyor belt of ocean currents in the North Atlantic or the melting of the Antarctic glaciers or all of them together. We don't know how soon these things may reach a point of no return, but we know for sure that they will if we don't make changes. To stop these trends, the UN Gov Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us we need to make uh, immediate deep carbon emissions reductions and that emissions must peak before 2025, which is of course almost exactly two years from now. Unfortunately, we're not on track to achieve those goals. Ryan Orozco carries his seven-year-old son Johnny on his back while his wife Amanda waits at the front porch to be rescued from their flooded home in Brentwood, California on Monday, January 16th. That's day before yesterday. It's possible this water has not even gone down yet. Over the past year in the U.S., more than 3.3 million people were displaced by climate-fueled natural disasters, including hurricanes, floods, fires, and tornadoes. Scientists warn that the U.S. will experience increasing threats to water supplies, destruction of homes and buildings, and we will face the challenges of forced migration and dislocation both inside and outside of U.S. borders. What can we do? We know we can't fix the whole world by ourselves, but we can do our part right here in our local communities. And that was how Hingham Net Zero got going. Uh, so we started in the summer of 2019, uh, three Hingham residents, and we just wanted us to do our part. We wanted our town to do what we need to do to cut carbon emissions here before it's too late. And I'll tell you more about what we've accomplished a little later on. But I was invited to uh, answer the question, what would Hingham Net Zero recommend that you do about the climate emergency? Well, we know we're in a very deep hole. So what's the first thing you do if you wanna get out of a hole? It's stop digging. No more fossil fuel infrastructure. Don't expand your existing heating system when adding onto your house. We'll talk about some good ideas on what to do about that uh, and how to do it differently in a bit. Don't buy a new gas car. In fact, you won't be able to buy a new gas car in Massachusetts starting in 2035, so why don't we start now? And as a society, no more new gas pipelines or extraction infrastructure. We can't afford the ones that we have. Okay, so we've agreed to stop digging. Here are three ways you can do that as an individual or as a family. First, use less energy. The most environment positive energy is the energy you don't use. Promoting energy efficiency is not as exciting or cool as many other approaches, but it's actually the first step for everyone who wants to slow climate change. The next step represents the huge shift that we have to make as families, as citizens, as states, nations, and the world. Everything that is currently powered by fossil fuels must be electrified. You might point out that electricity is often generated by burning fossil fuel, and that's right. Renewables are still a small part of how we generate electricity. But if you live in Massachusetts and you're served by National Grid, Eversource, or Unitil, which is not in this, this area, we're mostly National Grid and Eversource in, in, uh, on the South Shore, these companies are required by the state to increase every year the percentage of renewables used to generate their energy. 
So every year, your electricity becomes greener without you lifting a finger, whereas gas or oil will always be gas or oil. On the South Shore, the towns of Hingham, Hull, and Braintree own their own electric utilities, and they can decide what kind of energy they'll buy. Right now, around 57% of the electricity we use in Hingham is powered by wind, solar, hydro, or nuclear energy, which is carbon-free. And these municipal light plants have also committed to reduce carbon emissions. So by switching from oil or gas, which will always be 100% carbon emitting, to electricity, which is getting greener all the time, you will make an immediate impact on your carbon footprint. Finally, in order to make a difference, we all need to get active. We all have to pull together. So let's start at the top and get concrete now about the individual actions you can take that actually matter because they really do. Use less energy. Turning off lights when you leave the room is all well and good, but insulation and weatherization is the big one when we're talking about energy efficiency. Many of us in our geographical area live in antique homes that need this work like me. So the first thing to do is get an energy audit of your home. If you are a national grid or Eversource or Unitil customer, you can get a free energy audit through the Mass Save program. After you've had your audit, they recommend changes and they provide very impressive rebates to help you make those changes, which are funded by the utilities from a charge on your bill. They often cover up to three quarters of the cost and they will create big savings on your energy bill, even if you do nothing else. If you live in Hingham, you can get a free energy audit from Hingham Light. If you are also a national grid customer for gas, which about 40% of people in Hingham are, you can also get a mass save audit and be part of that program as well. Hingham Light also offers incentives for energy efficiency measures too. You can look them up on the web at hmlp.com. When you're looking for ways to conserve energy, it helps to think about where the energy mostly goes. You can see here that the other major sector that we are part of as individuals and families is transportation. So these ideas, public transportation, EV, they're pretty obvious. We're glad to see that electric vehicles are finally going mainstream. One way I can tell is by counting ads when I watch sports events on TV. The vast majority of ads this year are for vehicles and the vast majority of the vehicle ads are for EVs. General Motors and Nissan are feeling so behind on this that they are both advertising vehicles that don't even exist yet. This is a good sign. And we at Hingham Net Zero feel like it's kind of downhill from here for EVs, especially since, as I mentioned, in 2035, it will no longer be legal to sell a new gas powered vehicle in Massachusetts. So since EVs are a great example of replacing fossil fuels with electricity, they make a great segue to replacing fossil fuels with electricity in your home. Households create 40% uh, of emissions nationwide, well, that, that does include transportation, but clearly this is a place where individual choices really matter a lot. There are many uses in your home to consider, and you can see some of them here, gas stove, gas or oil, hot water heater, gas dryer, but by far the most important question to ask yourself is, how are you heating and cooling your home? HVAC, that's the big one. Let's take a look at all the ways of heating a home in Massachusetts and, and let's take a look at what they're expected to cost this winter. Over on the right, you can see that electric resistance heating is by far the most expensive way to heat your house. That's the old fashioned kind of electric baseboard heat which really isn't built anymore, but for, obvi for obvious reasons, but it can still be found in some mid-century houses sometimes. Next to that, oil and propane come in second highest for cost. On the far left, we see that overall in Massachusetts, gas is the cheapest fuel for home heating. But wait, what is this other thing? Electric air source heat pump, what is that? That is the answer to the question, how will we heat our homes in the future? Heat pumps are a technology just coming of age for HVAC in the US, Europe is somewhat ahead of us, but it's a very efficient method of heating a home using electricity and adoption of heat pumps for HVAC is what will allow us to say goodbye to fossil fuel. Before we get deeper into how it works though, I wanna point something out. The cost of electricity here is quoted at 40 cents per kilowatt hour. Unfortunately, that will probably be accurate for National Grid and Eversource this winter but municipal light plants are different and the price for Hingham Lights electricity is gonna be more like 17 cents per kilowatt hour this winter. So if it's less than half what National Grid charges, you can see 
that heating with electric heat pumps in Hingham this winter will be cheaper than heating with gas, at least in Hingham. What is a heat pump? You very likely already have a heat pump or two at your house. Your central air conditioning unit operates as a heat pump, and so does your refrigerator. Your refrigerator takes air and sucks the heat out of it, expelling the excess heat out the back and circulating the cooled air into the fridge. Air source heat pumps use the difference in air temperature between indoors and out to either heat your home or cool it. One unit can do both. This is an example of what they look like. Here's a visual sketch of how it works. It operates by heating a refrigerant fluid outside your house using a compressor, just like your central air conditioning, if you have that. The fluid is piped into your house where it releases heat and then it's piped back outside. They look a lot like central air conditioning units, um, if only because that's what they are, except they also run backwards and they do heating too. This is just a sample of what they can look like inside. Um, on the left is a floor unit and top right is a wall unit and top uh, bottom, uh, right bottom is the ceiling unit. The wall unit may look the most familiar. That's what most have looked like in past years and they are the cheapest unit, but demand for more attractive indoor units has led to the development of these and other kinds of units depending on the manufacturer. That they both heat and cool is a tremendous advantage. They can replace both your heating and cooling system. You can see that the only difference in these two drawings is the flow of the refrigerant versus on the left, it's hot refrigerant being piped into the house, and on the right, it's super cooled. There are a number of different ways it can be installed. If you have a ducted air system already in place, the outdoor unit can send the refrigerant to an air handler in the basement, just like the current system, and use the existing ducts. You may have already heard of the ductless mini split system. In this model, the outdoor unit sends the fluid to an indoor unit in each room, like those we saw earlier. If you don't have ducts, these fluid hoses can run in the attic or the basement to reach all the rooms. Ductless mini splits have another advantage. Every room has its own unit, which is separately controlled, meaning every room is its own heating and cooling zone. So you can tune the system to be exactly right for each room, and you can program them to adjust to different times of day and different seasons, leading to both more efficiency and more comfort and savings. Or you can have a combination of the two. In this case, the upstairs uses ducts and the downstairs is a mini split setup. There are actually a lot of heat pumps installed across the South, much more than here, because when they were first made commercially available decades ago, they were perfect for light heating demands, but they really couldn't keep up with the requirements of a New England winter. But modern heat pump technology has caught up and now it's possible to use it for your only heating source. This Mitsubishi, a uh, model called Hyperheat, which we've seen some pictures of, is rated for 13 degrees below zero. Unfortunately, many HVAC installers have not yet caught up with this, and many will discourage their customers from considering it. If this happens to you, find another installer. If you have hot water heating, some heat pumps can drive that system. That would have advantages over replacing your heating system completely with a ductless system. But here are some technical challenges. There are some technical challenges uh, to this method, and industry is still working it out. This method may make heat pumps more affordable for those with hot water heating systems, but it is still developing as a technology. Also, I want to mention this other technology you may hear about. Ground source heat pumps work the same way using ground heat instead of air heat for energy. So here you see four different ways to put your refrigerant lines underground for a ground source heat pump. There are a few homes in Hingham using this technology, but it's a larger installation product project and residential applications are not as common because they're more expensive to install, but they are more efficient to operate. The new elementary school to be built in Hingham, the new foster school, will use this technology. The building committee opted to dedicate the larger sum upfront to install it because it will be cheaper over the life of the system. So how do you get started? First, get that energy audit we mentioned. In order for the installation costs to pencil out, you need your home to be running at maximum efficiency. And that's something we all need to do just to lower our energy usage. Then the heat pumps will lower your energy usage even more. Now decide how much of your home you want to heat and cool with heat pumps. Only a whole house conversion puts you on the road to eliminating fossil fuels from your home, but every house is different and you may wanna start small. On the other hand, the current incentives for whole house conversions are amazing. For example, if you are a National Grid or Eversource customer, you can go through Mass Save, 
if you complete their home energy audit and implement the recommendations, and then you convert your whole home to heat pumps, uh, Mass uh, Save will give you $10,000. Also, the federal tax credits may be up to 30% of costs, and that's a credit which lowers your tax bill directly. If you investigate all the incentives available, you may find you can afford to think big. Then you want to start getting quotes from installers. As I mentioned, not all the installers are up to speed, either with the installation process or even with what heat pumps can do. They come from a variety of backgrounds and they may have more or less experience. But getting a good quality installation is crucial for success. Hingham residents have access to free coaching on heat pumps paid for by Hingham Light. The consultants at Abode Energy Management, which help you will help you uh, define what you want your project to be, and then they'll evaluate your proposals that you get from installers to make sure they're appropriate for your home and in accord with best practices. You can find out how to get going with the coaching program by going to HMLP's website, hmlp.com, and clicking on the sustainability tab. So is it expensive? Yes, it is. Finding the resources to make this enormous shift away from fossil fuels is the big challenge. Fortunately, the federal government and the state are taking this challenge seriously. We've mentioned the Mass Save program. They offer a lot, masssave.com. If you live in Hingham, the light plan offers incentives. You're eligible for the heat pump incentive if you heat with oil or electricity or anything else like wood. If you heat with natural gas, you're eligible for, for the Mass Save program. And we mentioned the federal tax credits. Uh, for people outside of Hingham, the best place to start is with Mass Save. For Hingham residents, the light plant is rolling out its new Electrify Hingham program. The goal is to have one place on its website where you can go and learn about everything available to support you in your decarbonization process. Uh, it's a work in progress, but you can get there by going to the Hingham Light website and clicking on the sustainability tab. I've mentioned that Hingham Light has contracted with Abode Energy Management to provide free heat pump coaching to Hingham. One tremendous tool they provide is their approved installers listing. And nothing stops people like who don't live in Hingham from using that list as their jumping off place when you're looking for quotes. To find this list of installers who have been trained and, and who Abode uh, has certified as being good for installing heat pumps, you can go to the Abode website. The link is listed here. Note that it's abodeem.com. There's another energy company with a similar name. And when you're there, click on MLP programs, meaning municipal light programs, and choose Hingham. And from there, you can navigate to the installers list. Good place to start for anyone on the South Shore. But of course, there are all those other fossil fuel applications in your house that we mentioned earlier. What about those? Fortunately, there are alternatives for those too. On the left is an induction cooktop. It's a new electrical technology, which is much more efficient than the previous electrical technology. In the middle is a heat pump water heater to substitute for your gas or oil-based hot water heater. And on the right, we're all familiar with electric dryers. The good news is that there are now electric dryers which use heat pumps instead of resistive heating, so they will be much more efficient than the usual kind. Of course, it's not really doable to replace everything all at once. The idea is when you need to replace something, replace it with the climate-friendly option. What you can do very concretely today is familiarize yourself with the choices you'll have. Make a plan. Make a list of what appliances you can buy to replace your existing ones and what kind of HVAC systems you'll choose for your home when the time comes. Because it's so easy to find yourself in a spot. Your hot water heater has failed and you need another one. Or, or worse, your gas furnace has given up the ghost. If you haven't made a plan for what to do, it will all be just be too easy to call your plumber or your installer and they and you might take the, the path of least resistance. And so educating yourself today will help you make the best decision in the future. And that can make all the difference in whether or not it's even feasible to reduce your carbon emissions at home. Of course, if you find yourself in a position where you can afford to replace something early, go for it. With every consumer choice that you make in your home, you can ask yourself the question, Am I doing what I can do to stop digging? So we in Hingham Net Zero hope you'll start thinking about electrifying your heating and cooling. It requires planning and resources, but along with transportation, it's the largest impact you can have on climate change just by changing your lifestyle. So here again are your three climate solutions for individual action as recommended by Hingham Net Zero. We've listed some things you can do individually. 
Let's talk for a minute about where individual actions fit into the big picture. First of all, you can't do this alone and you already know this. For example, as one pretty easy thing to do for your community is to vote only for leaders who are as committed as you are to making a change around climate action, but others will have to do that too. Even adding up all the individual actions everyone in the world could take won't be enough because there are huge changes that must be made at the world level by nations, states, cities, and towns, and business entities. But of course, you're not alone. You are not responsible for fixing the climate. We all are, and we can do this together. Working together has big benefits. It energizes us. It makes possible larger changes than what we can do by ourselves, just like Hingham Net Zero did when we asked the town to make a climate action plan. And we wanna be able to tell our children and grandchildren that we were part of the big changes. So good individual choices are necessary, but we know they're not sufficient. The other piece is to join with your neighbors, make changes as a community. And that's what we in Hingham Net Zero have been trying to do. What we can do together is what will ultimately get the job done. So I was asked to tell a little bit about what Hingham Net Zero has done. Uh, we're an example of working together locally. In our experience, people can grapple with local changes much more easily than worldwide ones. And we just call it doing our part. So what do we do, Hingham Net Zero? We advocated for leaders to create a climate action plan for the town and put it into action. We also began holding online workshops on how residents could take steps to cut their carbon emissions. You can see some of them listed here. They're posted on our website, hinghamnetzero.org. We write articles for the local periodicals as another way to spread the word. We hold signs about actions people can take here locally. And we go to public events to raise awareness. Here we are in the Hingham uh, July 4th parade with our red, white, and blue Teslas. Um, and we try to elect climate aware leaders to our town government. So what have we accomplished so far? In 2021, after a year and a half of us attending meetings and holding signs and organizing, town meeting agreed to create a climate action planning committee to come up with a plan for the town to reach net zero carbon emissions. Also in 2021, we helped elect a climate activist to the Hingham Light Plant Board to help plan our town's post fossil fuel future. Another big focus for us was working with the town building committees, which as I mentioned, were planning a new elementary school and also a new public safety building. We were able to help with the research and ideas on carbon reduction, which considerably reduced the emissions that we expect from the new buildings. In 2022, we asked the select board to create a town sustainability coordinator position to carry out the climate action plan when it's completed. Town meeting approved that, as well as the new low carbon municipal buildings. We also helped elect a second candidate to the light board. And now that we've helped the town itself get on board with the project, we're turning our attention to creating educational programs like this one to help our neighbors figure out how to do their part in the plan. So community education is gonna be our primary focus going forward. We're looking for more places to present this information on what heat pumps are and why we need them. So if you're a member of a church or a community or a business group, or you'd just like to get some friends together uh, in your living room to spread the word, just please drop us a line. We'd like to do this. Um, if you'd like to be on our email list, just send an email to hinghamnetzero at gmail.com and we'll keep you up to date on what we're doing. And thanks very much for your time. And I hope we can have a conversation. Wow. Uh, thanks so much, Laura. That was really informative. Um, there have been a few questions that have come in. Um, I believe that the chat function is has been disabled for everybody. However, uh, you can type in anything in the Q&A function, um, and then um, I can moderate and ask any questions. So, um, so Laura, there have been a few questions that have come in. So first off, um, here's a question. Um, we bought a house built by an electrician in 1992, and all our appliances were heat and electric. After several winter power failures, which actually I can relate to, we ended up having gas brought into the house so that we could cook um, and brought a wood stove for heat. What are the affordable non-carbon-based al alternatives to provide heat and electricity to a home during power outages? Wow, great question. Um, so uh, the answer to this is coming down the pike. It may not be here yet, but uh, for a house that's, already, that's powered by electricity, the answer is a battery. So you know how when the light goes out, 
you you get out your flashlight and you use batteries to light your home. Uh, uh, most of us are uh, going to be wanting to have some kind of a battery backup system if we are all entirely fueled by electricity going forward. And there are several different um, companies that make batteries for uh, the home, and uh, they are expensive right now. They're going to, prices are going to come down because uh, they're going to be manufactured in bulk. And, uh, you know, it won't, it won't get you through a three-day outage, but you should be able to get through a three-hour outage um, with something like a residential battery system. And it also opens up, um, there's a, a system, there's a, uh, a state program called Collect Connected Solutions, which is for people who own home batteries. If you buy a home battery from one of the installers that's associated with Connected Solutions and you sign up with the Connected Solutions program, you have hardware and software with your battery that allows the utilities to address uh, peak um, peak issues in the summer or the winter, which we're going to have when we're heating with uh, electricity, by uh, using your battery a little bit to actually bring some of the electricity out onto the grid. Not when you're having an outage, but um, if you if you're charged up during a low uh, a low price time, and then the electricity can use it during a peak time to uh, prevent uh, peaks from going over the top. And that's kind of the vision for the future: is that um, there are going to be a lot more batteries and your town may um, may develop a system called a mini um, uh, a grid uh, system where battery large batteries can help maintain a neighborhood. But that's kind of the vision of the future. But right now, the first step is people are, are going to be buying batteries to, to address just that problem. And of course, I have a house that was built in 1790. And then the next part was 1850, and the next part was sometime in the 20th century, and the next part was in the 21st century. But the 6, 1790 part was built to be heated with wood, so that's that's my backup plan. Wow, well, that's yeah, that's it. Seems like the more demand that and more people that are getting on board with this, the more options, uh, affordable options, might be out there for folks. Um, like myself, I know the watershed director uh, Samantha. Uh, she has a Tesla battery, and and it will charge and save some power enough for lights and uh, and and refrigerator during power outages. Um, of course, as she says, she's not living large, but it does definitely keeps some things running. So, mm -hmm. I guess this a uh, good lead into the next question. I thought heat pumps implied a geothermal system, but it sounds like that's not the case. I was told that my old 1850 house would be too leaky for geothermal to work well. Would a heat pump work for me? My house is in the mountains of New Hampshire. Oh, well, thanks for joining us from New Hampshire. Uh, and it often gets to be uh, 50 below zero. So she, so I can't mess around. Good, good question. Now, really good question. Of course, the first issue is, is your house insulated as, as much as it can be? And that's the first step that you can take that will ultimately save you money, even if you don't ever go to a heat pump. And right now, the heat pump, uh, I think the bottom uh, temperature that residential heat pumps are rated for is that Mitsubishi hyperheat system that I mentioned that only goes to 13 below zero. So no, it's not going to, the, you know, as it, as it currently is, uh, the technology will not get you down to 50 below zero. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, 20 years ago, they could barely do they could barely do 40 degrees. I mean, so you'll see heat pumps all over Florida, but you won't, wouldn't see them here. The technology is improving all the time. And it may come to pass that there will be a heat pump technology that can, uh, that can address your, your situation. Mm -hmm. Great. We've got a lot of great questions coming. Oh, I just want to do a shout out. Thanks to everyone joined. We've got record. We've got over 110 people wow. uh, uh, listening in. So thanks so much for everyone uh, uh, joining tonight. Um, how far down do they dig for ground source heat pumps? Excellent question that I do not know the answer to. Um, you, you don't always have to go down. I showed that uh, picture where sometimes they will lay it out in a grid in your backyard, um, you know, a few feet down, or they will go um, straight down. But I, I don't know the answer, and I don't even know whether the answer is dependent on what the heat load of your house is, or whether it's completely independent about of, of that. So I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to that question. 
That's all right. That's all right. Um, do we have any data on the usage of the recently installed uh, EV charging stations in Hingham? Yes. Electric vehicle um, charging stations. Yeah, it's picking up. Um, the mention is of um, three new charging stations in Hingham that were installed with the help of a state grant. Uh, and as an EV owner myself, I know that it can take a while to figure out that there's a charger there, you know? So we, what we are seeing is there was nothing for a couple months there and now slow pickup in the usage of those uh, chargers. And I expect that uh, that they're gonna get good use, especially for example, the one over at Carlson Fields. A lot of people come there from say, for soccer for their kids from Marshfield or someplace. And they're really gonna wanna have the opportunity to charge before driving home. So I am predicting a good future for that, but um, they're just starting to get used now. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, one is thoughts on solar panels on the roof. And the other question is, is solar a viable energy source for households? I've heard horror stories about damaged roofs. Uh, what about ground panels for large properties? So sort of your thoughts on the roofs as well as different solar options. Okay. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's really good. Um, as it happens, I can show you a picture of my solar uh, installation on my barn that was built around 1850. Um, and in order to put this solar installation on the barn that was built in 1850, I had to get some considerable uh, carpentry to come in and shore up the roof. So it really depends on the age of your roof and the condition that it's in, but a um, competent installer will uh, be able to evaluate that and uh, figure out you know, if, you're, if your roof is up to the job or not. Um, so I have this I have this installation and also another one on the house itself, which is uh, facing south. And we it's oversized for our house. And, and during the summer, um, the Hangham light plant pays us because we sell all of our excess heat uh, electricity, excuse me, to Hangham light that we don't use. Um, and uh, so, but we sized it knowing that we were going to want to be heating our house with electricity coming shortly. And we're hof hopefully be moving, getting our own heat pumps put in shortly. Um, but um, the answer is yes, it is a great source of electricity for your house. And a competent installer will be able to look at your electric bill, look at the size of the units that you can put up and tell you exactly when it will be paid off based on what you're going to save on your electric bill or what you sell back to your uh, electric company. So um, it is a it is a great, um, if you're thinking about going to uh, electric heating, it will be a great way to lower your electric bill because of course, when you heat your house with electricity, your electric bill is gonna go up. So yeah, it's highly recommended. And then about ground source, uh, ground mounted um, solar, that's certainly, I know someone in Hingham who has ground mounted solar because the Historical Commission um, could not live with him putting um, solar on his historic house, which was in a historic district. So he put it on the ground. It's actually um, much cheaper to uh, put ground mount solar in than um, solar that goes on your roof. So if you have the space for that, you can definitely consider it. Brian, Great. and Lauren, sorry to interrupt here, but I, I did a little Googling uh, for the question about how deep the trenches need to be. Oh, thank this you. Is, uh, this is according to the Department of Energy. Uh, requires trenches at least four feet deep. The most common layouts either use two pipes, one buried at six feet and the other at four feet, or two pipes placed side by side at five feet in the ground in a two foot wide trench. So that sounds like the kind that you put in a grid you know, a few feet underground, but there are the ones that go straight down like wells as well. And I don't know the answer on that, but thanks for looking that up. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, all right, I'm gonna combine a quote then with a question. Uh, and thanks for being patient, everyone. We got a lot of good questions coming in, Laura. Um, hi, I just wanted to share that through MassSave, I obtained a seven year no interest loan to install mini splits. Very, very cool. And then a question, wall mounted mini splits are not a good option for our house. Can you talk about the floor based units a little more? Um, so say begin while 
wall bait say that again wall, wall, wall mounted bait. mini splits are not oh. a good option for a house can you talk about floor based units more okay so i'm assuming that the reason it's thought not thought to be a good uh, application is because they're not as attractive as the other kinds of units and the only difference between the wall mounted ones and i also showed you the ceiling cassette ones that look like they look like uh, you know air conditioning vents in in the ceiling uh, the only difference is those are more expensive than the wall mounted units, but they work just as well and can and can do just the uh, uh, just as well heating your house. So if, for example, you're planning on um, taking out a hot water system, you can put those uh, floor mounted units right where the radiator was. And I think they're more attractive than a radiator. Um, here's a, a comment. Perhaps it's time to bring back the clothesline and design indoor spaces for air drying clothes. No question. Uh, yeah, I absolutely, that's a great idea. And also I, I wanted to thank the, um, thank the uh, participant who mentioned the low, in, the no, the low interest and no interest loans, uh, by Mass Save. That's an, something they offer that I did not mention. And so I'm going to go right away and put that into the presentation. Um, uh, because that's a terrific, um, a terrific opportunity that they offer. Mm -hmm. uh, here's along those lines. Any idea when will MassSave be fully up to date with the new federal subsidies, Inflation Reduction Act? So those actually are going to operate completely separately from MassSave. MassSave is the program that the state requires the investor-owned utilities to provide for you. And then it's paid for by a charge on your bill. The um, federal um, stock, the federal money is going to eat, is going to provide um, uh, tax credits, and then also some of the money uh, from the federal government is going to come to the state to be uh, handed out through some program not yet designed by the state, and it will be separate from Mass Save, and we don't know what that's going to look like yet. So don't have a good answer on that. Thanks again, Laura. These are a lot of questions coming in. You're, you're rapid fire and doing a great job. Um, are the solar panels working on the top of the train station in Hingham? Will they are. Will the solar panels be installed? <laughs> so will they be installed on the new Foster School? Okay, good, great question. So um, most people who live in Hingham uh, know that the very large uh, solar arrays that were installed on the commuter rail stations at West Hingham and Nantasket, both of which are in Hingham, um, were not operational for a couple of years uh, because of very complicated financing issues. And every time I tried to delve into it, it got more complicated. Uh, but in the end, that was all sorted out and they have been operating now for uh, over, over a year and a half. So, and, and that they're having those large solar arrays on the Hingham grid really has actually been very helpful because in the summer, when we hit our peak from air conditioning, of course, um, the electricity gets more expensive when you get closer to the peak. And we have a set contract with the T, or with actually with the third party that owns those. And you know, they we buy the electricity from them at a certain rate that never goes up. And so it really helps us um, you create savings both for the light plant and for and for customers to have those. Um, so that was question number one. And question number two was, please remind me, Brian, it was, uh, um, it was, and, it was, will solar panels be installed on the new foster school? So, uh, that, that is the hope. And, um, I'm working right now with the light plant. I have a, a small committee that operates under the general manager of the light plant called, we're just calling ourselves the municipal solar working group. And we are looking at plans to install, um, solar panels on lots of municipal buildings in Hingham. We may get to, for example, the first one may be the new maintenance facility at the, at the South Shore Country Club because that's being built right now. Um, but uh, we don't have the for sure answer on the new foster school yet. It's being built solar ready. How that will be financed depends on, um, do, will does the project come in on time and under budget, which it they usually do in Hingham. And if they do, they may have funds left over to do that. Um, if they don't, then we at the light plant are going to be looking for ways that we can help uh, finance the installation of 
uh, solar arrays both on possibly on the new uh, elementary school, but also on many other municipal solar municipal buildings in town. Okay, there's a couple questions of folks interested in um, uh, finding the best source for information on competent solar panel installers and companies uh, that sell panels. And someone mentioned the quote, competent installer. There are so many solar installers promoting their services. What's a reliable source for uh, reputable solar installers? Boy, that so. is a that is a tough question because it's it is a little bit of a wild west situation now. Um, I think uh, overall the solar installers are getting better than they were five five or six years ago. People who were just kind of dabbling in it um, have kind of gotten out of the business, and the people who are in it now overall are of a higher quality. But um, here is one idea that I have: um, the um, and I don't know if this is still, I don't know if this is still available, but I'll just suggest it. The state um, offer the department of the DOE, our Department of Environmental Resources, um, offered a program called the Solarize program. Um, and it and it was a program where they had a list of um, accepted installers, and uh, people in a community would get together. And they would make an arrangement with one of those installers and the inst and then they would they would go out in the community get people to sign up and then they could get if they got a certain amount of signups they got a better price uh for the bulk for the bulk purchase and so what i found useful about that actually i live in hingham and municipal light plant towns were not eligible for that program but i found the their list of installers really useful so that that's actually what gave me the idea to suggest um for heat pumps using the installer list that the uh, abode offers for municipal light plants because you know, you can still use those installers. So I don't know if the Solarize program is still happening at the state level, but that is one place I went when I was looking for a list of uh, installers. But other than that, I don't know of any other uh, place where you can, I, I think the advice is generally just get, you know, educate yourself as much as you can and then get three quotes and, uh, you know, compare them off one against another. Okay. Um, another question. What about solar roofing tiles rather than solar roof panels? Are you hearing anything about that when it comes time to put in on a new roof? I have heard a rumor that there is someone in Hingham who is looking to install those. Those, as far as I know, those are a Tesla product. I don't know of anybody else who makes that uh, product. Um, but my guess is it's going to be way more expensive than um, solar panels. But um, if you... Um, you know, feel really strongly about how it looks, then but sure, investigate that um, for sure. I, I, I would love to see it. I would love to see um, such a roof, but I, mm -hmm. I do know they're going to be more expensive than your standard solar panels. And um, Laura, I don't know if you mentioned this in, in your previous answer, but someone is is hoping that you might be able to share the company that you went in for solar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really want to be on the hook for that, you know, to tell you the Unders truth. Um, understandable. And it, so, uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry. I, I feel like um, I don't want to have to answer for that, if you know what no I mean. Worries. I, I, uh, no worries. No um, worries. Uh, we've been told that when solar panels are at the end of their lives, they are considered hazardous waste. If that is true, are there plans in place to handle this? So I understand that there are companies that now that some solar panels are getting to be 20 years old that are looking at recycling the materials in, in solar panels. Um, so I hear that that is uh, that's on the way, but I don't know anything more about it than that. Okay. Um, are heat pumps air drying? Uh, like, do folks feel like they need to use humidifiers in the winter in conjunction with the use of heat pumps? I wouldn't be surprised because it is it's a lot like you know, the, the effect is um, like forced hot air. It's basically um, the, you're having air blown out of, a, out of the unit into the room and that's the means of heating it. So that would not surprise me at all. Okay. Um, is there a plan for community solar in Hingham? So that's a really interesting question. I, I, I'm glad you asked that question. So um, community solar is a, an arrangement whereby uh, someone um, could be like a group of individuals uh, will find a place to to put up a solar array and then allow individuals to invest in that 
uh, solar array. It might be, so imagine that you live in a house covered with trees, which a lot of houses in Hingham are, and it's not, you can't really uh, effectively put solar on it. You might want to participate in some other solar project. Um, and so I looked into that uh, some years ago and it turns out it, it, it is incredibly complicated um, financial thing to do to be selling one solar panel or selling an investment in one solar panel to 30 or 40 people. Uh, it's very complicated to handle. It's an investment um, uh, structure. So you actually have to be certified by the SEC as an investment and that's complicated. And um, so I, I think it's a great solution for people who uh, don't live in municipal light plant towns. But where I came around to on this is uh, if the Hingham light plant buys solar energy, which we do, that's community solar. It's our community. We've all invested in it. We all own it. And it's much easier than uh, finding a place to put up a large array and then managing an investment uh, arrangement with 30 or 40 people. Now, that that's my attitude. But honestly, I understand that the Braintree Electric Light Department does have a community solar program that they make work. So I may be completely wrong about this and maybe we should go in that direction. Uh, but those those are my thoughts on it right now. Okay. Um, how does Hingham Light manage to have rates much lower than Eversource? We don't have to make a profit. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no profit making involved. Um, so, um, you know, we buy electricity the same place as we do, they do. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get worse wholesale prices because we're so small. But um, all of the money that like Hingham Light makes goes back into keeping your electric system up and running and nobody puts money in their pocket. Um, great job with all these questions. Sorry. There's a lot of questions and we apologize if we don't get to all of them. There's, there's a lot of good ones coming in. Um, have you seen rooftop solar panels which appear more like shingles and more aesthetically pleasing but perform comparable to the large arrays? Yeah, I think those are that's those are the that was the question we were talking about the Tesla okay. product that looks like shingles and I haven't seen them yet, um, but I can't wait to see them. I, I I don't know anything about you know how they work. I'm sure they will be more expensive than solar panels, but they are going to be a lot prettier. All right, um, I, you may have answered this before, but is there a, a list or a resource um, to help find a good reputable uh, solar source? No, um, unless the state is still offering its solarize program and you could go online and type Massachusetts solarize program and see if you can, if it's still operating, they used to have a list of um, sol solar installers who were approved for operating in their solarize program. And so um, I thought that was better than nothing. But um, once it again, the like recommendation is get get three quotes and compare them. Yeah, and it looks like one of our uh, participants, uh, if you scroll further down, has the website for uh, Solarize Massachusetts. Oh, great. You could drop it in the chat, maybe. Okay. Yeah, it's in the chat right now. Thanks to okay. uh, Michael. Let me, try to, let me try to do that. Oh, um, uh, someone used Energy Sage to find an installer, and they are very happy and will oh, recommend them as a solar great. installer. Energy yep. Sage, yep. yeah. A great company, and they offer a lot of different... Um, energy uh, related services. So that's really good to know. I'm gonna, if somebody asked me that question later, I'm gonna recommend Energy Sage. Okay. Um, uh, oh, uh, what about standby generators? I was on a natural gas unit for four days. Can you suggest an alternative? Good question. Well, the ultimately the alternative is gonna be batteries uh, to the standby generators, but there are some situations where you have to have them like the, um, the uh, I think uh, the um, public safety facility that we're building in Hingham is going to have to have, by law, a standby diesel generator um, because there just isn't um, there isn't the technology to back up a crucial public building of that size, and they don't have room to put the size of battery that they would have to do to do it. But in the long run, residential batteries like the Tesla batteries are going to. Uh, I don't. I don't know how many you're going to need to get you through four days. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that you know in the big picture in the long run that's going to be the solution 
Okay, I just put, hopefully everyone can see it in the chat. Um, thanks, Tom. Uh, a uh, mass.gov uh, service details to learn more about solarizing. So I'm glad um, there's still a link going. in there. Um, so if, you're like feeling, if you live uh, not in not in, in Hingham or Hull and you're feeling enthusiastic, you should, you know, get some of your friends together and do a solarize program in your town. In Belmont, they ran a solarize program and they got 300 homes to sign up to put uh, solar on their roofs. So, um, so you kind of get together with a company and you work out a deal and then you go out and get people to sign up and you get a better price. Great. It looks like somebody else also used Energy Sage to get in contact and quotes from multiple companies with ratings. So they're, they're saying it's easy to start the investigation process. Oh, I'm so glad to know that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, another one, I use Sunbug Solar to install two separate arrays on my home in Cohasset. Um, one in 2014 and the second in 2019. Great company, great service, they say. Excellent. Um, another question. Any guess as to how soon before heat pumps will be able to be used to fuel hot water heat baseboards? Wow, I'm so glad you asked that question. So the problem is that right now, uh, heat pumps cannot heat hot water hot enough to to um, to run a hot water heating system, if you know what I mean. If you're heating with hot water uh, running through your baseboards or your radiators, um, heat pumps are not able to uh, get to that point. But there is, uh, there are some companies in Europe who are generating that, uh, who are working on that technology right now, trying to improve heat pumps so they'd be able to do that. And I can't say, I can't imagine how long it will be before that technology is available here, but I hope within the next couple of years, because that would save people a lot of money if they could simply swap out their furnace in a hot water system for an outdoor uh, condenser unit and keep on heating with hot water. That would be huge. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, hot water uh, heat pump hot water heaters though, um, but not for domestic heating yet in this country. I'm going to say. Okay. Um, looks like there. So someone's saying um, Solarize program is not active any longer. And then oh. quotes. It looks like there's a quote from a, a page. Uh, while Mass uh, CEC is no longer uh, has funding for Solarize Mass uh, Solarize Plus programs. If your Massachusetts community is designated as a green community, it may be eligible for funding to help subsidize the cost of running a Solarize style program through oh, a green communities grant. So that's the Mass Clean Energy Center. Um, and is, so it's masscec.com, I assume, um, where you can go to find out about that. So I'm hoping they left their list of installers up, but I don't know if they did. Anyway, Energy Sage sounds like it's the current solution to that problem. So I'm glad we know mm -hmm. about that. Um, let's see, how would I determine the cost to heat my home with a heat pump? mini split if I were to install one. So you you what you you should um, get three quotes and they will tell you um, how much it will cost to install and then they will give you a projection for uh, what it will cost you to heat your home with it based on what you what the cost of electricity is in your town. The installers will be able to estimate that for you. Okay. Um, someone says GAF also makes solar shingles. Oh, that's an, another company makes solar shingles. Cool to know. Okay. Um, a comment, maybe the obsolete solar panels could be used and recycled into building tiny housing to handle the housing crisis. <laughs> it's pretty expensive, tiny housing, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty much any housing is expensive right now. Yes. But yeah, uh, I, uh, let's see. It looks like Energy Sage is for solar quotes. Um, a comment. So, okay, so the... Uh, go clean mass cc um, dot com slash installers. I put that link in there too. There you um, go. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, is a clearing house for solar quotes? Is there a question there? No, oh, oh, it's a it's a clearing house for solar quotes. Oh, oh that's what? in addition to energy sages for solar quotes. Okay. Okay, my apologies. Um, what about electric vehicles? What company has the best technology? 
Well, there are so many choices now um, that it's a great it's a great thing to have so many choices. Um, so the advantage of uh, Tesla was, uh, even though their cars are very expensive, they built their car from the ground up to be electric as opposed to taking some car they already have and trying to turn it into an electric vehicle. Um, so that used to be an advantage, but um, they're very expensive compared to what else is on the, on the market now. And I don't think, I don't feel competent to opine on who has the best technology. Um, I wonder where we could find that out. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So to clarify, so Energy Sage will help find an installer and will give you a consultant to work with. And it's Energy Sage, like Sagebrush, Energy Sage. I put it in the chat too. Um, okay. Uh, Plymouth River School was built as an all-electric school in 1969. What plans are there to renovate and redo that, um, and redo that school using solar or heat pumps or geothermal? I'm so glad you asked that question. I was at my municipal solar working group was at a meeting with the school department today, and I was told that their facility study is going to identify, uh, when it comes out, there will be three roofs on schools that need to be replaced uh, urgently, and Plymouth River is one of them. So we were talking about what a wonderful opportunity that will present when you replace replace the roof. That's the time to put solar on, um, and uh, because it's heated with electricity very inefficiently, it costs a mint to heat uh, Plymouth River. It always has. So it mm. is like the prime opportunity to figure out how we can replace the heating system with um, with heat pumps. So with all of these that I mean that's at the top of that's at top of mind for us right now since they're going to replace the roof this is the moment to act. The question is always how will we pay how will we pay for it? How will we pay for the upfront cost of um, of putting uh, in a large new kind of heating installation it's be much more expensive than replacing the wiring or whatever they might need to do to upgrade what they have that to, to be the same as what they have. But it would be the top building, municipal building that we would want to move to heat pumps right away because it is the most expensive to heat. So we are we are thinking about that and trying to figure out where we could get the funds to do that. Just a couple more questions here. Uh, can I use an electric hot water heater to supply hot water for a radiant flooring heat system? Glad you asked that question too, because I have just purchased an electric uh, 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 heat, hot water heat pump, hot water heater. And um, in in the case of this particular unit, the answer was uh, uh, you. Yeah, it's um, it's not very effective for that. Once again, because of the you, you need way more heat to do heat. It's just the same as like a radiant radiator heating. You have to be able to heat the hot water much hotter than heat pumps do. So uh, the company that I'm working with, a couple of, some of their customers tried it and didn't have a very good success rate with that. So, mm -hmm. however, I know that there, and, and I have some radiant uh, flooring in my house that I would love to keep uh, after we go to heat pumps. And I know that there are companies in Europe that are uh, solving this problem. And um, and we may soon have that technology available here. It's just not yet. Great. Looks like one more question. Is one or the other of ducted or ductless heat pumps more efficient? Yes, um, ductless heat pumps are more efficient because you're pumping, instead of heating the air and pushing it around, you're uh, pushing this very efficient, super cooled or superheated uh, refrigerant around through um, insulated pipes, so it is more efficient. Oh, great. Oh, looks like, okay, well, um, electric vehicles, regarding electric vehicles, some states are starting to pass legislation to phase out EVs by the mid-2030s. What reason is behind this? Are, uh, to phase out EVs? Mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps the, perhaps the reference that I saw the reference to a lawmaker in Wyoming who introduced a bill to do that, to make it, in, to get rid of electric vehicle sales in Wyoming. And uh, so I read the whole article, of course, because I was fascinated. 
And uh, his reason was that electric vehicles are going to destroy the oil and gas industry in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. A and B really is because he was furious at California for making plans to phase out gas cars. So he just wanted to do the same thing back. Okay. But no one expects it to pass. Political theater. Not even Maybe. in yeah, not even in Wyoming <laughs> yeah. are they expecting okay. it to pass. Um, any problems with refrigerant leakage with heat pumps? So that my my builder is concerned about that. And um so I can't answer that question uh based on knowledge, but common sense tells us that that could happen. And I don't I don't have any words of wisdom about that. Okay. All right. Well, those are a lot of good. Okay. Oh, it's like, oh, thank you. Yeah. So a lot of folks said thank you. Thank you to all of those who join. Um, that looks like it concludes the questions. A lot of great questions. So you did a great job fielding those. <laughs> that was a lot. Don't um, have all the answers. Yeah, that's okay. It looks like there's a lot of interest out there, which is yeah. which is great. And a lot of folks, and it seems like um, your your uh, lecture tonight was incredibly well received. So we really appreciate you, Laura, uh, for taking the time uh, to speak with us and to speak with the members of the community tonight. Thanks, everybody, for your interest. Let's all do this together. We can't do it alone, but we can do it together. Absolutely. Laura, Absolutely. That, that was very inspiring. Appreciate you coming on tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Um, so uh, any other last things that uh, you want to add, Laura, before we start to close things down here? Nope, just that. We can do this together. Let's all let's all get hop to it. Great. Great. Anything uh, uh, from your end, Doug? Well, I guess I would uh, I would welcome Laura to come to our Climate Cafe on March 1st as we're going to end this series with a uh, a climate cafe at Stellwagen uh, Brew Company here in Marshfield. And uh, oh. I, I bet you would add an, an awful lot to the discussion there that night. That sounds like incredible fun. So please send me an invitation. Be happy to go. Thank you. Great. Good, good point, Doug. Well, with that, um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. We had an amazing turnout. About 110 people were watching. Uh, so it's really great to see people coming out uh, interested in this uh, this topic. So, Oh, we I do were... have something to add. If, there, if anybody belongs to a community group or a church, or you would like to get some friends together in your living room to watch this presentation and talk about putting heat pumps in your home, uh, send us an email at hinghamnetzero at gmail.com, and we would love to do that. Great, great. And this this uh, program has been recorded, will be made available too. Of course, I, well, I say that now everyone who's, who's watching is already here, but it will be made available yeah. uh, if folks couldn't join. Um, so great. Well, thanks again, Laura. We really appreciate your time tonight. Thanks. Um, uh, so once again, a, a very special thank you to our sponsors, Clean Harbors and the Mass Cultural Council of Duxbury, Hanover, Marshfield, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Situate. Thanks once again for your support. Also a big thanks to Doug and uh, Mass Audubon, our partners uh, in the Water Watch Lecture Series. Um, we are excited to then hopefully see all of you next week for on January 25th, uh, Wednesday, same, same time, 7 o'clock. Uh, for the history, culture, and teachings of the Mattachusett people. Um, chief da, uh, Fisher, uh, the council chief of the Mattachusett tribe in Massachusetts Indian Nation is going to join us and we're going to uh, listen, learn, and understand, discover the history and culture of people who called these South Shore lands their home for thousands of years. Uh, so uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Fisher speaking with us next week. Um, well, again, thanks to our sponsors. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Doug. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see all of our participants uh, in the coming uh, lectures. So uh, have a great night, everyone. Again, um, uh, Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Doug and myself are really excited to have all of you here. Thanks for joining us and, and have a great night. Bye-bye.